I didn't just speculate about this. There are some, I would say, uh, indicators, prefigural warning signals that avocado politics is likely to be a growing trend. Hello and welcome to another episode of Breakthrough Dialogues, the podcast for pragmatists and problem solvers brought to you by the Breakthrough Institute. I'm Alex Trembath, your host and deputy director here at Breakthrough. For this episode, I sat down with Nils Gilman. Nils is the vice president of programs at the Bergruen Institute in Los Angeles. He also recently served as the chief of staff to the chancellor at the University of California, Berkeley. Nils is honestly one of my absolute favorite thinkers on global governance, uh, on the future of liberal democracy, and has also been at times an important critic of environmentalism and environmental culture. Most recently, he authored an essay in the Breakthrough Journal on what he calls avocado politics, which I won't spoil and will let Nils define for you shortly in this conversation. Nils Gilman, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. So I, I find that I, I don't think I can do a, a very long preamble into this conversation because I will inevitably mention the term avocado politics, uh, which I imagine many of our listeners will, will need a definition for. So why don't we just start there? Uh, you recently wrote an essay for the Breakthrough Journal uh, in which you coined the term avocado politics. What are avocado politics? Well, it's a little bit of a tongue in cheek term that I invented uh, with a hat tip to the 1970s in Germany, when the first major German, major European Green Party emerged in Germany. Um, and the people who started that Green Party were basically a bunch of post 68 er uh, politicians. Uh, often they'd been youth social movement uh, leaders and they were lefties. Uh, they were, you know, various varieties of crypto semi Marxists of one sort or another. And then when they saw the sort of way that uh, 68 politics had failed, they moved over into environmental politics and made that the centerpiece of their party and created the Green Party. And they were then labeled often uh, somewhat sarcastically as avocado politicians, because, excuse me, as watermelon politicians, because they were green on the outside, but red on the inside. And the idea was that they were trying to get their old red politics enacted with a new set of arguments rooted in green and environmental concerns. So avocado politics is a similar thing, but for the right, where it's green on the outside, but the core, the pit, is brown, brown shirt as in fascist, right? So if brown is, is the color of fascism, avocado politics is a fascist politics that's wrapped in a green outer layer. I want to I want to get into sort of what that means in the real world examples of how that might manifest. But first, I it, it really struck me we've got watermelon politics, we've got avocado politics. In your mind, what is it about environmentalism or green politics that makes it so amenable um, to sort of cov uh, covert uh, politics by really other interests or other means? Well, I think that there's a few different things that are going on with. Um with environmental concerns. I mean, environmental concerns are things that are happening as generally side effects of human activities, capitalist uh, modes of production uh, in the world. And um, so we worry about environmental degradation. We worry about global warming. These are things that don't have an obvious um, or a singular uh, set of causes or a singular set of uh, potential interventions to address them. Um, the question is, is it, are there distributional questions you want to take, uh, look at? Are there questions of industrial structure that you want to look at? Are there questions of incentives? Are there questions of, you know, the role of money um, and inequality? All of those things uh, intersect with environmental concerns. And the question is, which of those things do you want to emphasize and uh, mobilize environmental arguments in order to promote uh, political mobilization around? So I think, you know, you can take, uh, you know, the fact that we have uh, overconsumption of various kinds of uh, commodities and reach a variety of different conclusions. Maybe we should spread those uh, consumption out more uh, more evenly. Uh, maybe we should try to hoard it for one particular group. Um, there's not an obvious. You can't get from is to ought, as you know Hume famously um, observed 250 years ago. And so, just because we observe a phenomenon that we find bad in the world, it doesn't necessarily obviously uh, imply a specific set of policy, policy solutions. Hume is is obviously a, a good referent for, for that point. The, you know, the one we like to use at Breakthrough is this concept around wicked problems, which uh, I often get sort of misdeployed as just complicated um, or difficult, which is not really what that term meant when Horst and Riddle, I think, were the, the urban planners who coined the term wicked problems. Um, 
their observation was that there are a growing number of problems. I think they identified sort of poverty as, as one of them in the 1960s or 70s, whenever they wrote that paper, um, that don't have sort of a singular cause and effect, but that are problems upon which different interest groups, dif uh, different populations, different polities can project their own perspectives onto. And that makes it difficult not only to solve or even address the problem, but for the different interests to even engage with one another. Um, uh, and, and so that that is where some of this, uh, you, you think that is where some of, uh, of this messiness uh, around political ideology, around messaging comes from? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I don't think it's at all a coincidence that uh, when um, uh, the term wicked problems was coined in the late 1960s and early 1970s, that's also the exact moment that uh, the new environmental movement was really getting going and also other kinds of social movements, whether it was uh, new kinds of identity politics, uh, feminist politics, all of those new kinds of uh, what were known as new social movements in the 1970s were really, uh, I think, a reaction to the rise of wicked problems that were not going to be easily solved through liberal technocratic means where people thought that there was an obvious solution. I think the earlier phase of governmental activism um, in the early part of the 20th century, late 19th century, building um, sewage systems or primary education systems or basic healthcare systems. These were ones that were, there wasn't a lot of ideological dispute about uh, who exactly uh, should get access to those things. These were seen as universal benefits. They weren't distributional or zero sum solutions. Uh, they were things where everybody could benefit. Once those problems had been largely solved, we had primary health care, we had, you know, primary education, this, the, the remaining set of social challenges were much more complicated to take on um, and didn't have obviously uh, obvious and clear technocratic solutions. And that's really where the term wicked problems comes from. And environmental problems um, are a classic example of that. Uh, the modern environmental movement really starts with Rachel Carson. Uh, in Silent Spring in, in, in the early 1960s. And there she was dealing with something very specific. It was uh, industrial pollutants uh, in the air and in the water uh, and the way in which that created um, specific, uh, you know, health effects, poor and ill health effects on human populations. And there actually were pretty straightforward technocratic solutions to the problems that she identified. The next generation of environmental challenges that we started to face, which were how do we balance energy production um, with uh, the need for, you know, creating a clean environment? Um, how do we deal with things like global warming? These were things that were much more complicated to deal with. They were wicked as opposed to, um, as opposed to non-wicked problems. I, I feel like we could go on and on about that. Um, but I, I am um, sort of, you know, curious on the one hand, and uh, I, I do kind of want to challenge you a, a little bit on the other hand. You, you mentioned some examples in uh, in your essay, um, uh, I certainly buy as uh, as I buy the concept and existence of, of watermelon environmentalism uh, that an avocado environmentalism might exist. But does it? Is this something that we should actually be concerned about? Is this is uh, is are there examples of avocado politics that you see in the world? Yeah. So there are. I'll get into a couple of examples soon. But I should just say up front that I believe that this is this is a forecast. Uh, and the reason it's a forecast is that the environmental politics of the right in most of the developed world for the last 25, 30 years has been focused primarily on denying that there's a problem that needs to be addressed. But you only need to look out the window, walk down the street. It's becoming increasingly impossible to deny you know, that there are crazy wildfires in Australia or the temperatures are rising uh, all over the planet, that the Arctic and the Antarctic are melting. Um, and so a denialist politics is, I think, going to become increasingly foreclosed as a realistic way to uh, couch these concerns. So the question is, what's the right going to do uh, in, in, as, as the possibility of denialism recedes uh, more and more? I think liberals have assumed, environmental liberals have assumed, that once people, once the right accepted the reality of climate change, they would naturally also have to accept the kinds of solutions to environmental politics uh, that the, the left and liberals have long been proposing. Um, and I don't believe that that's the case at all. I think it's uh, precisely for the reasons we were talking about. You can come up with very different kinds of solutions, quote unquote solutions, uh, or at least methods for addressing uh, questions of ex excess carbon production or uh, resource over exploitation 
um, that don't necessarily involve a Green New Deal um, or solutions that are pro-egalitarian. They can be very anti-egalitarian too. Um, and precisely for the reasons we were talking about earlier, the way these problems are fungible and appropriable by a variety of different um, uh, kinds of political idioms, I think that's what's likely to happen as climate change denialism in particular becomes an impossible position to sustain. So, um, yeah, I mean, in, indeed, uh, there's been quite a bit of theorizing that the denialism wasn't rooted as much in sort of a scientific illiteracy or a, 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 a sort of head in the sandness as in a reaction by conservatives, hierarchicalists, um, uh, sort of maybe the authoritarian right um, against the way that global warming was presented to the scientific and policymaking community. You know, we had scientists testifying in Congress and we had uh, the United Nations creating the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and suggesting a series of treaties and taxes to uh, address the problem. Uh, policies that are, are, are sort of custom made to be disliked by the right. Um, so, you know, we've, we've it's not super surprising why we have had this culture of uh, of denialism when the the way that we in the dominant culture talk about climate change is sort of from the progressive left. So how is, is the like what is it is it just sort of the wildfires um and and hurricanes and sort of climate messaging that that is tipping the culture and the conversation um towards uh towards the right or the authoritarian right taking the problem seriously um or is there is there something else that's happening? So I think I think I think the the drumbeat of empirical evidence of a variety of sorts about the stresses to the environment, whether it's plastics in the ocean or overfishing or collapsing, uh, you know, availability of various kinds of mineral resources. Climate change, obviously, is the number one, uh, the number one effect. And that has a whole bunch of things, whether it's bigger storms or wildfires or what have you. I think all of these things collectively add up to making it more and more challenging to maintain a position that there's not a problem that needs to be addressed. The question then is, how should that problem be addressed? And when I wrote the Avocado Politics essay for the Breakthrough Journal, um, I didn't just speculate about this. There are some, I would say, uh, indicators, prefigural warning su- signals that avocado politics is likely to be a growing trend. And I can just talk about a couple of these, right? Please. Um, so, uh, you know, let's start with something like um, uh, Marine Le Pen's national rally, uh, which is probably the most uh, dominant or not dominant, but the most prominent um, far-right party uh, in, in Europe and in, in France. Uh, they routinely get 30-plus percent of the vote, and it's not inconceivable that Marine Le Pen may one day be the president uh, of France. Um, they have absolutely combined an anti-immigrant policy, um, classic far, other classic far-right policies, with uh, an embrace of uh, the land um, and what they call la France profonde, uh, you know, the old originary uh, population of France, implicitly Caucasian, um, and they traffic in a lot of, uh, you know, r- rhetoric of foreigners uh, being pollutants uh, within the French body politic. Um, and that the reason why France, uh, you know, and the world is struggling with uh, environmental issues is because uh, non-French people, um, by which they mean uh brown people are appropriating too much of the bounty of the land uh, that is the natural birthright of the uh, native French people. Um, so that's a really prominent example. I'll just give another couple of examples. Um, the uh, the far-right party in Germany, the AFD, um, they are, they're officially, the official party position is climate denialism, but the youth wing of the party has recently, uh, just last May, um, proposed that they abandon the denialist position and instead embrace uh, the reality of climate change. And the specific thing that they've proposed, now it was shot down initially by leadership, but it is the youth movement. So this is, again, why I think it might be coming in the future. Um, they propose that any country in the global south that is to receive uh, any aid money uh, or wants to do a trade deal with Germany or with the European Union uh, has to adopt a one-child policy. Um, we could talk about other examples that are a little bit more, uh, you know, perhaps fringe at this point, but are indicators uh, and warning signs, as intelligence analysts would put it. Um, the mass shooters in New Zealand and Waco uh, last year both put out manifestos. And in these manifestos, 
they justified their deeds as uh, as a defense of the environment from the takeover uh, of brown people and immigrants. Um, they shot up immigrant communities and they justified it in environmental terms. And just one last example, you know, a, a, a homegrown political movement, the Northwest Front, which is this uh, neo-Nazi group based in the Pacific Northwest. They have a flag uh, that is uh, blue and white and green, and they have a slogan. They say the sky is blue and the land is green and the white is for the people in between. Um, and so they too are uh, sort of trafficking in an environmental re rhetoric. They want to kick all the Native, uh, Native Americans out of the Pacific Northwest uh, and make it a, an Aryan Republic up there. And they justify this specifically in environmental terms. You know, it, it's funny listening to you. On the one hand, it's this, there's a bunch of sort of recent examples of this kind of avocado politics that does mark a shift from the last 20, 25 years of sort of mostly denialism or delayism or whatever you want to call it coming from the dominant political right parties. Um, but a, a lot of this actually calls to mind um, and I don't want to paint the sort of current, the modern environmental movement with too broad a brush, but cost of mind early environmental thinking around, um, uh, around sort of natural states, um, uh, around sustainability, you know, sort of like er early proto environmentalists like William Vogt, um, advocated eugenics. Paul Ehrlich wrote about brown people in India, really the way that one would describe like cockroaches or vermin. If you actually read the, the opening chapters of the population bomb. You know, there's been quite a bit of uh, of political ecology and, and, and geographers uh, writing about the similarities and just the way we talk about purity or native versus non-native when it comes to ecosystems and when it comes to human populations. There's there's a whole bunch of just sort of mental and psychological frames um, and political frames um, that make these comparisons uh, kind of uncomfortably easy. Yeah, I and mean, part of what I tried to do in, in in the piece for the for the journal was to actually show that this is not just a flowering of some marginal figures today, but there's actually a long history of uh, alignment between um, far right politics and environmentalism, and it goes all the way back to the 19th century. In fact, the term ecology uh, was coined by uh, a German um, a German biologist uh, Ernst Haeckel. Uh, in the 19th century, and it referred to these kinds of organic systems that all were in a natural harmony with one another. Um, and uh, he also happened to be a virulent anti-Semite and racist and, and early eugenicist, uh, and this was not a coincidence. The term Lebensraum, which was the term the Nazis used uh, to justify the mass killings in Eastern Europe to create living space for the Aryan German folk, um, was coined by one of Ernst Haeckel's followers in the late 19th century, um, that what ecologies want to do is create living space for their own uh, populations. And there was absolutely a culture of like purity and impurity, a language of purity and impurity that was coined back then. So that's on the uh, European side of the Atlantic. There's also a Native American, a homegrown American tradition uh, of similar kind of rhetoric. Um, the uh, probably one of the founding fathers of the American conservation movement. And by the way, it's important to note the difference between conservationism as a language, right? What's it being conserved for? Who is being, is being, is, is, uh, are these resources being conserved for? And the implicit answer and often even explicit answer was it's being conserved for the native white population. So probably the leading figure in this movement uh, and the connection between these things was Madison Grant. Madison Grant was um, a, a public intellectual. He was, uh, you know, one of the uh, most important founding figures in the New York uh, National History Museum, um, you know, worked with Gifford Pinchot to help create the national park system. Um, and he also happened to be a person uh, who was a virulent anti-immigration person. Um, so uh, in prior to 1924, the U.S. basically had an open borders policy. Um, Slowed down a little bit during World War I because of logistical reasons. But then after World War I, the population start to come in. Uh, you know, the immigrants continue to come in. Um, and uh, Madison Grant in 1916 had written a book called The Passing of the Great Race. Uh, you will not have a hard time guessing which race he was talking about. And this was a sort of a classic piece of rhetoric that, uh, you know, about cultural pessimism, as historians like to refer to it, where... Uh, you know, he saw that inevitably the uh, Anglo-Saxons were going to be overwhelmed 
uh, by uh, brown and yellow people. He was more anti-Asian than anti-African or, uh, um, or South Asian. Um, but uh, he also sort of saw Eastern Europeans and Southern Europeans as basically being biologically inferior to uh, Anglo-Saxons. And he therefore proposed that the borders be closed. And his testimony in front of Congress on the basis of his book in the early 1920s was decisive for uh, the passage of the anti-immigration, the nationalities-based immigration policy that came in in 1924 and was our immigration policy from uh, the 1920s through the 1960s. Uh, so the connections uh, go way back. And then, you know, if you fast forward to the late 1960s, you know, the immigration laws get changed in the, 19, in the mid-1960s. And again, I don't think it's a coincidence that as the racial uh, race-based immigration laws get abolished in the mid-1960s, this is precisely when Paul Ehrlich and the population bomb and the, and the question of what was being referred to at the time as lifeboat ethics. What are you going to do? There's a bunch of drowning people. Are you going to let them onto your boat and you're all going to drown? Or do you just allow them to drown? It's a social triage movement. And it's absolutely justified in precisely environmental terms. We have a limited amount of resources and we can't possibly allow, uh, if we want to preserve our way of life, allow all of these people onto our lifeboat, our, into our countries. How do you see the, at least the environmental left, and I, I want to get uh, to the, the right a little bit more, but how do you see the environmental left having evolved since Vogt, Ehrlich, uh, you know, obviously since folks like Grant um, in the intervening decades as we've come to be a, a more sort of globalist cosmopolitan environmental left uh, as the sort of political ecology, geography, environmental justice movements have arisen, not just in the United States and from communities of color, but from developing countries. Um, how do you think we have, have we done, have, has the environmental left done an okay job um, or not at, uh, at, at sort of correcting some of these at least coalitional and, and political uh, flaws uh, from their legacy? I think they have. I mean, it's, it's worth remembering that as late as the 1990s, the Sierra Club was probably the most uh, powerful anti-immigrant lobbying force in, in the United States. Um, and it was only in the 1990s uh, that the Sierra Club uh, finally purged those kinds of elements from, and it was, it was a big dramatic movement. There's quite a lot one can read about how that actually happened. Um, I think, you know, in terms of my own personal political preferences, normative preferences, I think uh, a, a uh, you know, a justice oriented mode of trying to think about environmental politics is the right way to do it. But it still has left the space open to be recolonized by the right. Um, the one thing I think that the environmental left um, or environmental liberals, I think, have done wrong. Um, and it's one of those things where it may, it seemed like a good idea at the time, um, although people are continuing to do it now, and I'm very worried about it. Uh, and this was really what motivated me to write the piece in the first place uh, for, for the Breakthrough Journal, is I think that there's been an increasingly, um, I don't want to use the word hysterical, but let's say shrill uh, and alarmist uh, discussion of the challenge, particularly around climate change, uh, that we face with in terms of the global environment. And I really worry about alarmist um, and extremist rhetorics. We only have 11 years or 12 years or five years or however long it is before the sky falls and, 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 and an apocalypse is upon us. Rhetorics of apocalypse, um, and there's a lot of empirical evidence from social psychology, don't tend to make people make good decisions. Um, and it also makes people... Uh, tend to be defensive and think about, okay, if there's a total crisis, if, there's a, if, there, if the sky is falling, let me protect me and mine first and foremost. And the, protect, the idea of protecting me and mine uh, is, you know, that is the core, I think, of right-wing politics. Um, I remember back in college, I took a political theory class and the professor said something, which he probably doesn't even remember, but it stuck with me for these 30 years ever since. He said, the beginning of all ideology is the phrase, people like us. Um, and I think that uh, the, the fear that I have about an alarmist environmental uh, rhetoric um, is that it's precisely going to drive people into those kinds of positions where they are just going to feel like, oh, my God, if, if we only have 12 years, then what we need to do is, you know, engage in resource nationalism, um, you know, make sure we exclude immigrants, build the wall, um, you know, 
try to do everything we can to inhibit Chinese and Indian and African development since if they try to live our lifestyle, there's no way we can possibly you know, have a sustainable existence. And people will move into a reactionary mode as opposed to a progressive mode. Yeah, I was going to ask you about this, really sort of who's on the hook for this wave of avocado politics. Um, obviously, there is a, a sort of growing uh, right wing nationalism, uh, ethno nationalism everywhere. And I talk I want to talk a little bit more broadly about that. Um, but how you know, like how should liberals, how should climate hawks be thinking critically about this. I, you know, I think they would argue, um, and I, I should put my cards on the table and say that I do just think less apocalyptically about the science of climate change than other people do. I, you know, I think I, I agree with you. The sort of 12 year stuff I, just is not found in evidence, um, which is my starting point. Um, but if you think that there is an, an apocalypse coming, um, then, uh, and then how do you talk about that? How, how, do, how does Greta Thunberg or, in, or environmental organizations in the United States talk about a problem uh, that they view as an apocalypse um, if it tends towards this type of backlash? Well, I think the first thing is it's not an apocalypse, right? It's actually not an apocalypse. Um, I'm old enough to remember uh, living under the shadow of a real potential apocalypse, which was a global thermonuclear war. That would be, a glo- that would be an apocalypse in the sense that literally the whole world or much of it would burn down. You know, all the nuclear weapons that were available in 1985 had been detonated. Maybe some people would have survived, but maybe not. Um, and, uh, that, you know, climate change is a very different kind of problem, it seems to me. Uh, it's going to make many aspects of human life more difficult much less pleasant, is going to disproportionately affect poor people. Uh, it's likely to provoke, you know, you know, if unabated, huge months of refugee flows, which will have to be managed in some way or another. But a, a refugee crisis is not an apocalypse. It's a refugee crisis. We've dealt with many of them for thousands of years, and one can get through those things. Uh, I think the more one speaks as if, you know, in eschatological terms, um, and I will note that this rhetoric of apocalypse is particularly popular in Western environmental politics. And it's probably not a coincidence that the kinds of eschatological thinking coming out of post-Christian you know, modes of thinking is, is, is coloring the way people think about you know, the, the, the climate change crisis. Um, I think that you know, talking about urgency... Um, the, the, the thing we have to steer between is we want to galvanize people to be acting with alacrity and urgency without scaring them into either passivity or reactionary right wing, um, you know, em- embrace of extremist measures that will be highly inegalitarian in other ways. And guiding our way through that is I think that that's the challenge. Now, in my view, we have to talk about things like what are you know the technologies that we can deploy? How can those technologies be developed and shared in ways that will both incentivize people to produce the technologies, but not slow down their deployment um, so that we can get the benefits of those things rolled out as rapidly as possible? Um, I, I do think that you know thinking about you know how capitalism gives certain kinds of incentives today that could be through uh, um, you know through regulatory me- me- means. Uh, redirected, I think that's part of the answer too. Um, but I don't think it's helpful personally to engage in sky is falling kinds of language because I think it just drives people into either despair or uh, the embrace of really negative kinds of politics. So that strikes me as a, a sort of much more optimistic, yeah, you know, I dare say sort of technocratic view on the climate problem in particular. Um, but I think it would be a mistake to leave our listeners with the impression that you're sort of Pollyannish about either the, cl- the climate pr- crisis or the crisis in, gl- in global liberal democracy. Um, I, and so I, a little bit of context, I think I personally got to know um, your work, uh, not primarily as it relates uh, to climate change per se, um, but in uh, your reaction to uh, to Steven Pinker's work. Um, uh, yeah, obviously, uh, Pinker is a figure that we think quite a bit about here at the Breakthrough Institute. Um, he's a senior fellow at, at Breakthrough, I should say. Um, and there's, you know, been an interesting reaction to uh, Pinker, at the, qua Pinker and at this point, um, in his and uh, in, in his narration of global progress, um, the ascendance of of uh, 
of of liberal democracy, um, the decline in violence, et cetera. Um, and that, I, I should say that shared, uh, you know, among other scholars, you know, Hans Rosling comes to mind. Um, uh, and it, it seems consonant with uh, the way you just described climate change in this instance. Um, you know, it's a problem, but it is a problem that we can solve, you know, largely with the regulatory state or sort of redeploying or better deploying tools of capitalism. Um, and that sky is falling politics or sky is falling regulatory approaches are not only not called for, um, but uh, could lead to could lead to backlash. Um, so is that, you know, sort of broadly how you see the world um, or, are, or are there sort of more dangers uh, under the hood that we should be concerned about? Yeah, this takes us this takes us a little bit away from avocado politics per se, um, although I'll, I think I can tie it back. Let me try. So um, my view is that uh, Pinker's and Rosling's and others assessment of the general progress of humanity from a material perspective and also, um, to some extent, from a uh, perspective of inclusion, um, over the last couple hundred years is simply undeniable. Human lifespans have tripled. Um, you know, the quality of life uh, at a material level has improved dramatically. Um, you know, while there's still obviously tons of oppression in the world, uh, you'd much rather be born a woman today almost anywhere than you would have liked to be born a woman there 200 years ago. Um, and you could go through similar kinds of things. We don't have slavery anymore, uh, or at least not nearly to the same degree as we did, uh, say, in the middle of or early 19th century. Certainly not in this country, but even globally. I mean, there is still is slavery, but it's not at the same global scale. Um, so there has been undeniable progress. Where I part company with uh, Pinker um, is I think he is uh, blasé, I think would be a term I might use, or... Um, you know, about the sustainability of the trajectories that we are on, um, both in terms of uh, material conditions um, and in terms of what you might call moral progress. Uh, you know, what you know, we've all uh, had seen the investment prospectus where they say past returns are no guarantee of future results. And I think of that um, a lot with respect to the progress that uh, Pinker rightly celebrates. What I have said to him um, is that I think he underestimates the degree to which the improvements that we've seen uh, materially and institutionally um, are rooted in institutions which themselves are under incredible amounts of stress today. I mean, you were talking about the rise of ethno-nationalism. Um, the rise of ethno-nationalism is also connected to another phenomenon, which is the deep discrediting of expertise in general. So you're right to say that what I was suggesting is a somewhat technocratic perspective. And the reason why I can't say that I'm optimistic that the technocratic perspective will be embraced and why I'm pessimistic that avocado politics may be the wave of the future um, is precisely that people no longer trust the experts uh, for a whole variety of reasons. And it goes back to the wicked problems issue that you brought up earlier. Um, people trusted technocrats when the problems they were taking on were amenable to technocratic solutions. Um, as technocrats increasingly had solved the easy, the, the low, you know, picked the low hanging fruit and were now on to the wicked problems hanging from the top of the tree, they found it harder and harder to actually solve those problems. And this has led to a progressive um, loss of faith in institutions. And you, there's a ton of longitudinal survey data that people have, in America in particular, but really all over the developed world, have lost faith in almost every institution, uh, whether it's churches or the federal government or uh, the Supreme Court um, or big businesses. The only exceptions really are small businesses and the military. Um, and, uh, you know, this gets into a whole other issue. Why, why have people lost faith in these institutions? My hypothesis here is that it's because the leaders of these institutions um, have not been held accountable when they failed. Uh, and we could, you know, this gets into a whole bunch of other things that nobody was held accountable after the financial crisis. You know, Bill Clinton was allowed to get away with perjury. Uh, Richard Nixon was pardoned. We just saw Donald Trump get acquitted in, in his uh, uh, in his impeachment trial for something he had obviously done. Um, so we're increasingly seeing elites not being held accountable. Um, and frankly, you know, one of the challenges we have is that scientific elites are seen as being the same way. When they get things badly wrong, well, they have tenure. Uh, typically at many universities, and they're not, they're, there's no responsibility that's held, the people, they're not held responsible. And so for people who live in a state of precarity, which is the increasing the condition that many, many people live under in the form of neoliberal capitalism that we have all over uh, the, uh, the world today, 
people feel outraged that these people who you know went to fancy schools and claim that they're experts on things, and then they screw things up, and then they're not held accountable. So I think that problem of a lack of, a, of elite accountability is leading to a collapse in faith in elites, particularly faith in technocratic elites. And that once, once that toothpaste is out of the tube, it's not clear to me that the kinds of improvements that those elites have driven over the last 200 years are going to continue to be sustained in the way that I think Pinker is um, too optimistic about. You already, you already talked about a, a sort of high-level view of a, a better way to think about environmental problems and uh, environmental policy. I want to react to just that last thing you were saying as, as we close by asking, what do you and I like do about that? You know, this is something that has been terrifying me really since November 9th, 2016, when it, when it finally hit me um, over the head, uh, which was probably much later than it, it hit folks like you and other people. Um, but as sort of expertise is waning in its value, um, you know, not just in its, accept, uh, in its acceptance, but in its actual value, um, then how uh, how do you at, at the Berberian Institute or me at the Breakthrough Institute or, or experts in, in general, um, how do we move forward? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously not a simple answer to that question. Um, you know, I, I think that doing things, uh, I mean, I would point to three things that we think a lot about at the Bagruin Institute. And these are not the only three things, but it's what we're focused on currently. One is I think we have to improve elite accountability. Um, and, uh, you know, when people screw things up, um, they should step down from their positions. Um, and, uh, I mean, I could tell some personal stories about that, that, you know, I've dealt with myself. Um, but I just think that, you know, people need to be held accountable uh, and elites need to be held accountable. It doesn't mean they need to go to jail if they screw up, but it means they should step down from positions when, you know, they've been, you know, at the helm of something that's gone badly wrong. Um, and uh, so that's that's one piece. Uh, the second thing is, I think part of the reaction um, that is producing a reactionary ethno-nationalist politics all over the world uh, is the fact that you know, most people um, are in situations of precarity and then they look at elites who are not held accountable and it, it outrages them, right? So I think reducing the gradient of insecurity between elites and, uh, you know, and, 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 and the majority of the population is an, another increasingly important imperative for us. So that involves decreasing inequality um, and increasing uh, not the social safety net, but also, you know, we're working on things related to what we call pre-distribution, creating, making sure everybody has access to capital that can, you know, provide them with a nest egg, uh, either to, you know, start a family, buy a house, tide them over if they're unemployed for a while or what have you. Um, so, you know, I think that there's, you know, decreasing precarity by decreasing inequality is another part of the story. It's really trying to get to the underlying issue as we interpret, as we assess what's driving people to embrace, you know, far right politics. Um, and then the last thing I think is just changing our democratic system. I mean, we have right now, um, you know, pop, what we call populist politics. I'm not always sure I know what populist politics are. I mean, I, I prefer the term anti-elitist politics because populist politics can target different kinds of elites and how we interpret, you know, the, the how we assess the populist politics has to depend on which elites are being targeted. I mean, on one level, Pretty much, you could argue that every president the United States has ever had since Andrew, J Andrew Jackson, on one level or another, was a populist in the sense that they targeted for a program an elite group uh, as part of their way of positioning themselves politically. But that doesn't mean that every one of the elite groups they chose to target uh, is, you know, an equally valid or worthy, uh, you know, target for those things. So I think that what we need to do is increase people's ability to feel like they're able to get their voice heard. Um, that they can participate without having to uh, embrace, um, you know, a, a populist or demagogic politician who claims to speak for them uh, in the sense that, you know, he, and it's almost always a he, is excoriating the kinds of elites that they resent. Uh, we're doing a lot of things here just in the state of California to try to make that uh, more of a reality. Um, you know, the, trying to do things around initiative reform so we can get people to, you know, participate uh, more um, in citizens' councils around the initiative process so that people can participate more fully and things like that. I don't think that there's our, there are silver bullets in short. I think we need to, you know, reform the plumbing of the system so that people feel like they have a voice, they feel like they're included, and they feel like they're not marginalized by the system. Nils Gilman, thanks for talking to us today. Thank you very much for having me.
Thanks for tuning in to Breakthrough Dialogues. If you like our show, tell your friends, rate us, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or whatever platform you get your podcasts on. I want to again thank my guest Nils and our producers Alyssa Kadaman and Tali Perlman. Catch you next time.